You know, you could take a 2000 horsepower Lamborghini and take your wife to, to dinner in it and she won't even know it's not stock. And that's just, that's phenomenal compared to where we were at 10 years ago. <laughs> Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and on this episode, we've got John from John Reed Racing joining us. Now, John is a name that's a little bit hard to pin down. He's not really a big one for getting in front of media, so we're really grateful that he's taken the time out to chat to us. Uh, John, however, is a fairly big deal, particularly in the Motec M1 world. He's one of Motec's probably pre- premier uh, developers of custom firmware packages and you might be thinking what on earth is a custom firmware package well we're going to find out today as we talk to John but in short he develops custom firmware that works with the Motec M1 platform to run specific platforms of car and these days it is getting harder and harder with the complexity of the electronics and modern vehicles to simply unplug the factory engine management computer throw that away and put in an aftermarket standard standalone. Sure, you may be able to get the engine up and running, but your ability to use the automatic transmission or dry, uh, dual clutch transmission uh, is probably going to be non-existent. Likewise, the gauge cluster probably won't work, the ABS, electric power steering, the list goes on. And that is why this custom integration is so key. Uh, some of the notable achievements that John is known for is his work with underground racing, specifically in their Lamborghini Gallardo uh, and Huracan projects, as well as their Audi R8 and Underground Racing, uh, one of the uh, companies that's really paving the way with the half mile and uh, roll race events that we see so prominent in the US. So it's a pretty big rivalry there between the Lamborghini and the Nissan R35 GTR crowds. So uh, we'll talk to John as we go through today's podcast and find out a little bit more about what goes into the development of his custom firmware that Underground Racing are exclusively using. Uh, Another area that John's well known for is his work with Ryan Turk in the US. Uh, Ryan, no stranger to Formula D and John has been pretty instrumental in Ryan's success there. Uh, One of the projects I'm really excited to hear running as well, which we talk about today, is the Judd V10 that uh, was tuned just a couple of days before John caught up with us here. So uh, probably anyone who has heard a, a Judd V10 sort of takes you back to that uh, era of the naturally aspirated F1 engine, certainly uh, a, an engine that is an amazing sound. So we'll find out from John how he got involved in the industry and how he's got to where he is today. Before we do that though, I just wanted to talk about one of our posts from our Instagram account and if you aren't following us on Instagram, we are HPA101. Uh, we try and share some really interesting and educational content regularly so I'd suggest if you want to learn more uh, that you should give us a follow. So this is a a post that uh, I shot a photo of it's Bo Yates uh, Toyota AE86 drift car that we shot over at World Time Attack a couple of years back and this runs the 3SGE Beams engine which has then been turbocharged. Uh, The 3SGE Beams engine runs continuously variable cam control on both the inlet and the exhaust cams. This is a shot of the engine where the exhaust VVT system has been disabled using a conventional vernier adjustable cam gear. So what that allows the engine builder or tuner to do is adjust the cam timing, advancing or retarding it in order to achieve optimal results. But optimal is questionable because what's optimal for let's say 7000 RPM is probably not going to be perfect for low RPM performance so it's really a bit of a compromise there with a conventional fixed cam timing engine. On the intake though the continuously variable cam control has been kept and if you're not aware of what that technology is it means that the intake camshaft position can be advanced or retarded very quickly and continuously while the engine is running by the ECU. So we can program an optimal cam timing target to suit the current combination of engine load and RPM and this can give a significantly wider power band, much better low RPM torque without sacrificing our high RPM performance. So essentially in a way uh, the best of both worlds. 
So there's a couple of questions that naturally come up here and we hear this all the time from our HPA members. First of all, how do we go about timing the cam timing originally and this is really when the engine is being built. Uh, the next question is once we've got the car on the dyno, how do we go about optimising that cam timing? And we've got a couple of courses there if you are interested that will help. Uh, we do have our cam degree in course which is really focused on those who are building engines. Uh, you'll learn how to create Directly degree the cam timing, irrespective of whether it's a vernier adjustable cam gear, fixed cam timing, or continuously variable. Doesn't matter if it's a basic single cam push rod engine or a quad cam V12. Got a nice simple six step process you can apply there to your own cam timing. We also cover some of the key aspects that you need to understand, such as how to use plasticine or play doh and dummy assemble your engine to actually confirm your piston to valve clearance. No one wants to end up bending a valve uh, because your cam timing has the valves a little too close to the, to the piston. Uh, the next course is our continuously variable cam control tuning course and uh, again I know that this is a, an area where a lot of tuners don't really understand the process to go through and when we break it down it's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, this course is perfect for those tuning engines with full continuously variable cam control but we also cover switch cam control systems such as Honda's VTEC, Nissan VTC uh, and a number of others. You can find both of those courses at hpacademy.com forward slash courses and as an added bonus as a listener to this podcast you can use the coupon code podcast 75 that's going to get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course and we'll put a link to those courses in the description that you can follow if you want to learn more. All right with our introduction out of the way though let's get into our interview with John. All right, welcome to the podcast, John Reed. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, I know that you're pretty fresh off tuning a really exciting project, which is the Judd V10 in Ryan Turk's drift car. Uh, give us some insight. Does it sound as amazing as you'd <laughs> expect? It does. Um, we were joking when I was down there that this is probably the most exciting, you know, six, 700 horsepower I've ever worked on, at least <laughs> since the beginning of my career when that was still a cool power level. Um, yeah. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. It's just unreal. Um, we yeah, it brings, wearing... back, brings back those old school memories of the naturally aspirated F1 cars. I mean, I listened to the Judd V10 and even the V8 hill climb uh, YouTube videos and yeah, no nothing nothing else quite like that sound. Yeah, it's, you know, that was always my favorite era of Formula 1, I think, was the V10 um, late in that era. And yeah. uh, just to be there on the dyno and hear that thing, yeah, it just takes you back to that. It's not quite the same spec of engine, but the sound is 100% there. So yeah, pretty incredible. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that Supra and the Judd V10 as we go, but let's kind of rewind the clock a little bit and get a bit of insight into how uh, you've got to where you are in your career. Uh, what, what's your sort of background that got you into to tuning, wiring, and everything you're doing now? Um, I mean, I always hear a lot of other guys say it too. I think I started tinkering at a pretty young age, um, always wanting to take stuff apart. Moved into dirt bikes and playing around with two strokes and stuff. And it moved into me not really knowing what I wanted to do and uh, not really being super interested in school. And sure. I was like, well, I need to make a living doing something. I kind of like this car thing. And uh, yeah, just kind of, I went to s trade school, uh, community college and got, you know, just a two year degree in automotive and went to a dealership. And I kind of thought that's where it would all, um, that's where it would end, I guess. I didn't really have a plan past that. Okay. Um, the dealership I got into was Toyota, um, probably 93, 94, which is where the Mark IV Supra came out or when yep. it came out. And I had a big interest in that kind of thing. And dealerships, nobody likes to work on the hard to work on stuff. Um, when you can work on Camrys and things like that, <laughs> nobody wants the twin turbo Supra. So I immediately got a lot of those and connected with owners of those and that's kind of where it started um, okay. for me. So Now there's a bit of a disconnect though between being a, an automotive tech 
and then diving deep into the world of, of ECU tuning. So, so how did you kind of join those two dots? Um, that kind of happened a little gradually. Um, it was kind of, I got to where I was helping owners with their cars, like I say, Supras, MR2, of course, and primarily to begin with. And people were doing little piggyback mods and typical bolt-on stuff back then. Um, what really opened the door was one of my customers who became one of my friends and then future owner of the first shop I worked at, um, bought one of the first AM plug and plays uh, for okay. the Supra. Standalones weren't super common then. Um, and we just kind of together started messing with it. He was a computer guy, uh, very sharp. I was knew a lot about cars and we kind of, between the two of us, uh, we had quite a bit of success getting that car up and running when many people were struggling with that uh, ECU and platform. Um, and it really, it took off from there faster than I would have ever imagined. Um, now, if we look at that, Mark, for Supra on today's standards, it's a pretty basic package in terms of th there's not a lot of engine technology, there's no continuously variable cam control, well, at least not on the, the non-VVTI version. Right, right. You know, it, it doesn't have CAN bus, it's not a complex uh, platform. Yeah. What were the struggles that you were seeing others having with, with the tuning on the Mark IV? Um, just looking back, it was just everything. Like even myself, I put myself in that category of, I remember spending a week messing around off and on just trying to make the idle correct and okay. simple things like that. You know, things that now would take two two minutes, you know, yeah. and uh, and just working through that. And I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure there was, you know, teething issues with the ECU. It's normal when something's new like that. Um, but yeah, yeah people no just doubt. couldn't even get their cars running. And here... Yeah. And it's when the forums are big and we had a running driving super on this ECU and that seemed to put us in a fairly small percent bracket of, of owners and uh, the car was doing quite well. So immediately people were wanting to fly, you know, hey, will you fly to work on my car? Like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> so what, at, what do you the, mean? <laughs> at this point, do you consider yourself a, a, a tuner or is there a bit of imposter syndrome creeping in at this point with yeah, people right. asking you to fly around the country? Right. Yeah. It, uh, I don't know. It just, yeah, I don't know what to think about it back then, you know, because I didn't feel like I knew really that much myself, but I guess if you know more than the people around you, um, they want your help. So. Um, yeah. I, mean, I think that that's uh, that's pretty realistic across the entire automotive performance industry. Right. There's, there's levels of knowledge. So if you're the the one, even if you've still got more to learn, if you're the one that knows more than everyone around you, right, uh, you're the one that everyone's looking up to. Correct. And I still have more to learn, so it hasn't really changed any. But I think um, you know, in, in general, if I was giving advice to one of our HPA members who wanted to learn how to tune. Uh, my usual sort of reply would be, you know, yes, you can learn to tune on a seven, eight hundred thousand horsepower turbocharged engine, but your envelope for tuning becomes much, much narrower, and it's going to be pretty easy to do some damage. And you're probably much better to get started while you're just getting your feet wet and learning how the ECU works and manipulating the software to get stuck in on a, a relatively low powered naturally aspirated engine where it's going to be difficult but not impossible to do damage. You went about this the other way. So, so you know, <laughs> yeah. what, what would you say about that? Was that a steeper learning curve? It was. Um, it was. We broke surprisingly few parts, though, in the beginning. Maybe it's the 2J engines just that good, um, that robust that it survived our early attempts at tuning. Mm. But we already had some experience messing around with the piggybacks um, sure. and the pitfalls that come with that. And uh, so it wasn't completely flying blind as to maybe what we wanted to see you know, air fuel and timing and boost levels and stuff. We just suddenly had way more control. Yeah. Uh, so it was a reasonably smooth um, learning curve in the beginning. Um, and like I say, the super is super simple and uh, and quite tolerant. Uh, you know, it's, you know, five, six, seven hour horsepower, whatever was the thing back then. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, it went surprisingly well. So Okay. 
Now, in terms of the tuning that you were doing back then, are you doing this on a dyno or is this street tuning stuff? Um, some on the street, some on a dyno, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was hard to find a dyno back then, but there were there were some around, so um, yeah, a bit of both. Uh, looking at what you had available to you in terms of tools back then with that early AEM uh, standalone ECU and the tuning tools, your wideband, etc., that you were relying on versus what we've got now. What's the sort of the highlight that stands out to you as a big advance? Um, you know, it was it was not bad. It was such a leap forward from what we were using before the standalone and before the wideband that that felt like the biggest leap of all. Um, the things we have now are obviously better, but it doesn't feel like as big of a leap. Um, on that particular platform as the leap to a standalone was um, for those cars. Talking about that sort of before we go any further, you know, I, I kind of started with a, a few Hondas as well with uh, piggyback sort of VAFCs etc, uh, very simple devices. So is this what you're sort of talking about with piggybacks or is it a little bit more complex? Where were the limitations and sort of what couldn't you do with the piggybacks you had access to? Yeah, these were the piggybacks like the the VPC and the SAFC and things mm-hmm. like that where they're just signal fakers, you know. And yeah. especially on the Toyota platform, it seemed like the reflashing wasn't even a thing. Still really isn't on many of the Toyotas compared to say a Honda or something. Definitely. Uh, on Honda and things like that, but. Uh, yeah, mostly those signal fakers, which leave a lot to be desired. Um, yeah. And so just getting a standalone in the car was just a, a complete revelation of control and power yeah. uh, versus what we had. If you're, say, in a Honda doing Honda and moved to a standalone, I don't think it'd be like nearly that big a step, um, or at least it wouldn't feel like it at first. No, I think it's, it's fair to say a system like Honda actually gives you a huge amount of control over what you want to do with the engine as well as additional functions that were never there in, in the factory and, and you definitely can't say that for every brand and, right. and as you say I, I, I'm not sure if there's a hardware limitation that's not really my area of expertise but it does seem that uh, in the mainstream at least Toyota and reflashing have not been good friends there's there's not yeah. a lot of uh, options for some of those earlier Toyotas like we see for you know, other popular JDM vehicles that, that are modified so so prevalently. Yep, correct. All right, so moving on with your sort of advances in technology, you're now firmly a, a, a MoTeC guy uh, using this this M1 platform, uh, and, and you're developing your own firmware for this. So just in, in a very brief sense, for those who maybe aren't, un, aren't too familiar with how the M1 platform works, can you sort of talk about what that is, what their production firmware packages are versus what you're doing? Sure. So the M1, um, like any ECU, requires uh, firmware to work. And uh, in the past, with any ECU that we would buy, typically AM, Motec, insert your favorite brand there, you buy the ECU, it comes with firmware. And those firmware contains features that the manufacturers put in there. And that's what we used to tune with. And that was always sort of the end of the story. Yep. Um, So you're limited by a function that the ECU manufacturers developed and however they thought for example boost control should be done that's what you're stuck with. Correct and I mean there's probably pathways at some level that you can beg the manufacturer for a change or a different strategy or a different feature but um, they can't just do that for everybody and uh, yeah it was really hard to get changes so you everybody yeah. just used what was there. Um, Motec came out to back it up a little bit, um, the M800, the gold box, they came out with a pretty cool setup where you could have these tables, but you could select for the axes from any of the available channels in the ECU. Um, yeah. So you could kind of build these tables and that was revolutionary at the time. Um, when I first got a, got to play with that, I'm like, wow, this is a game changer to just have that kind of flexibility to, to, to do these things. Cause you could have, you could build one table with a set of axes, have the the value coming out of that table feed into another table, and you could get quite creative with it. Um, mm. It was really cool. Um, and then the M800, of course, is getting older, and their new ECU lines, the M1. Um, where the M1 really changed the game was 
Sure, you can buy an M1 and you can buy um, firmware for it from Motec, fairly generic. They call it GPA, GPR, just general purpose racing, I believe that stands for. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like buying a normal standalone. It's very well featured, um, but that's their, that's just their sort of default firmware. Yep. Um, however, they allow um, users, end users, if you buy the right licensing from them, you can make your own firmware for these things. So now, not only do we have like the ability to do the you know, flexible things like we used to be able to do with the M800, we can just write our own firmware and make our own strategies and make the firmware look and do whatever you want. Um, and yeah, absolute game changer there. So. To take one step back, and this was my experience coming from the 100 series ECU, the Gold Box, which I, I used extensively in my own Evo drag car. And as you say, the flexibility with the, the tables and the axes, and you could, within reason, just about do anything you wanted if you're a bit creative. And sometimes there's a, a few workarounds there, but quite flexible. Right. Yeah. And then stepping into this new world of the M1 with Motex, uh you know production firmware i mean this isn't necessarily disrespectful to motec but it, it straight away actually felt very limiting because the way the m1 platform works is you no longer have that flexibility to change axes to your heart's content do you you're actually kind of locked in so if you want to do some of this more flexible stuff really the the development license and writing your own firmware is almost kind of a requirement yeah, I mean, it's it's a requirement for guys who maybe want to get more creative than what, like you say, it, it does feel a bit limiting. It did to me. That's how I ended up going down the path I went down. Um, and just the uh, the capability that it brought to the table was just hard to turn away from, even though I wasn't a programmer. Um, but yeah, you're right. It uh, it is a bit more limited than the M800 in that regard. However, we've been, some of my newer firmwares, I've been introducing flexible axes similar to what the M800 had okay. uh, to give the end user a bit more of that ability to just kind of do things themselves with the tables like you could in the M800. So um, that is, that has been coming out. So, okay. Yeah. All right. So w when it comes to developing new strategies or functionality in your own custom firmware what, what's driving the decisions there is, is this your own sort of you know wake up at three in the morning with a bright idea <laughs> i can do this and, and write it or, or is this customer driven um it's definitely both um i still do an awful lot of tuning and so a lot of it comes from just me wanting something a different way than maybe what motec wanted in the, because really most, all of my firmware started foundationally with Motex GPR. Um, yep. And so every, all the changes I've made are just either me wanting to do it a different way, wanting more flexibility, um, or my customers wanting something else. And uh, I'm always open to hear what my customers want. If it's something that's not way out in left field, like, hey, that's a great idea. Um, it usually gets in there for them, so. Um, sure. There are a and, lot and of then things. everyone benefits from from that Correct. functionality as you roll it out. Yep, everybody gets it, and so there's a lot of cool stuff in there, and not all of it's my idea. It's comes from the pool of users, and yeah, it really works out quite nicely. So a big part of this, you're dealing with functionality that that has a potentially huge impact on the way the engine's going to operate, or the way the car's going to go around a racetrack, or whatever you're doing with it. And it's obviously going to be pretty important to know that that's right before the car heads to a racetrack or even to the street. So what what's the process you go through of actually validating a particular function? Um, it depends on the function, of course, and the and where it's at in the firmware and what it's controlling. Some simpler level functions, like just say controlling an output, for example, that's intended to drive a relay or some sort of device. Um, often I'll just test it on the bench with the simulator and yep. uh, oscilloscope and stuff and just make sure it's reacting as intended when you set it up in the software. Um, engine related stuff, um, I definitely validate on a vehicle um, mm -hmm. wherever possible. Sometimes if we don't have an option to test it right away, then it, you know, when as soon as I can get it on the car, we'll, we'll validate it, so. Yeah, okay. 
because I can test it on the simulator, you know, injector drives and and coil outputs and stuff um, and have a reasonably good idea that, hey, everything's working correctly. And then at first opportunity, get it on a car. But um, I do a lot of testing here just on a, I have a side-by-side -side I use, it's all stock. And uh, <laughs> it's quite good for chucking some firmware in and making sure nothing's, you know, broken. So yeah, um, it goes back to your point that a stock machine sometimes is quite nice, you know, because they're really hard to, to damage. So yeah. you can have things way sideways and it doesn't matter. So so one of the other aspects when it, it comes to the flexibility of the development package is this CAN integration, which, which is another big topic that I want to dive into here because that's becoming more and more prevalent with these late model cars. And, you know, before we had people like yourself and the flexibility of, of custom can templates, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't physically possible to take a you know a twenty twenty model or just about anything for that matter and take the factory engine management system out of it and, and fit a standalone. And and now the the certain vehicles that you've developed custom support for, uh, just to name a couple that I'm aware of, the the, the Lamborghini Huracan and Gallardo and the R8. Uh, I I know you're 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 supporting those. So can, can you sort of break this down for those who, who maybe aren't aware of, of CAN at a high level? What is that and why has this added a complexity for us as tuners? Um, so CAN's just a two-wire communication bus, which in simple terms just passes information between the various modules that are connected to this bus um, throughout the car. Um, in my world, typically, we'll be dealing with the powertrain CAN bus. There can be multiple buses on on the modern car, um, the powertrain bus typically, you know, engine ECU, uh, transmission ECU, if it's a DCT or automatic transmission, and, you know, maybe a few other devices like that. And then often it'll then link up with other things with the body module. Um, it's added a lot of complexity um, in terms of adding a standalone ECU to these cars, because when you take the engine ECU out of one of these cars, a lot of stuff gets broken um, because it's no longer receiving the data from that engine ECU. Yep. And uh, so your dash doesn't work, your transmission doesn't work, like it's the car is broken at that point. So, so you might be able to get the engine to physically run, but you're not going to be able to select gears. You're not going to have RPM on right. the, the, the gauge cluster, ex for example. Yep, yep, exactly. And I remember when I first got started in this business, getting an engine up and running maybe was, that was like the big thing when you do a standalone. <laughs> you know, you get all your things populated and it wasn't quite as easy then as it is now, because now you just, if you put your injector data in and your, um, you know, set up your sensors, enter the engine displacement and set your fuel type, you know, the thing's gonna start. Like it's not mm. even, it's like cheating now. Um, before you had to have things a little bit more right and maybe there's a little bit more fiddling around now starting the engine like i say is probably the easiest part of the whole task it's yeah. like an it's an afterthought um now it's getting this integration figured out so like you say when you do start the engine you can see the tack move and you know the transmission will go into gear and things like that so what what's your process how, how does this start and what what's the sort of time that's involved in you reverse engineering all of this all of these messages on a, a complex late model car yeah it depends on how complex the car is i mean for and i don't think of myself as being the fastest at this either i know some other people that are much faster at it um, with backgrounds in computer programming and stuff um, but i've had some that i've done in a week or two uh, the complete car and I've had some that have taken months to fully sort and resolve. And that's not working, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week on it. But um, it's going and gathering CAN data and sifting through and trying to reverse engineer what it is and encoding it in the M1 and getting the M1 in the car, testing it and figuring out what's working, what's not. Go back to the stock ECU, reevaluate the things that aren't working, you know, try and decipher that data. Um, it's hard because there's no roadmap for this. There's no support from the OEs, of course. They don't sure. probably want us doing what we're doing. Um, so you just have to decipher in what they're doing just based on looking at what the signals are doing um, and kind of figuring it out from there. And 
If you're lucky and can get a factory scan tool in the car, you can compare what you're seeing on the can versus the channels in the scan tool and kind of line things up that way. Um, because again, for those who, who who aren't maybe familiar with this, you're not looking at some raw data and you know, you've know you got uh, engine coolant temperature on the CAN bus represented as a number that we may expect to, to understand, you know, maybe 80 degrees C if we were, we're here metric that's that's not what we're looking at you've got a, a raw hexadecimal number and then the scaling that goes into getting that two engine coolant temperature so it, it's not going to be necessarily obvious when you're looking at the raw CAN bus data that the the bite that you're looking at is actually engine coolant temp is that that fear yeah, it, it definitely isn't obvious because you're just looking at a stream of can data, but you can eventually, for instance, find the coolant temp, say, okay, I know this bite is coolant temp, but the mm. number still makes no sense to me. Like the coolant's 80 degrees Celsius, but this number is some other number. So then you got to figure out the scaling that the OE has used before they've broadcast that value out on the can. Um, and and that's where the scanner, the scan tool comes in because then you can actually see what the, the number is digitally correct, and can compare yeah. that to, to the raw hexadecimal number and do your scaling to, to kind of work it out. Correct, yeah. And then once you have that all figured out, it's like, okay, coolant temp is this byte and this is the scaling, then we can code that into the M1 so now the M1 can broadcast coolant temperature in the correct byte location and with the correct scaling and suddenly your coolant temp gauge works and potentially yeah. other things so and, and that's probably literally one of the simplest parameters or ch channels that, that <laughs> exist so we've given a really Correct. very very simple aspect but you know you, you mentioned dct dual clutch transmission auto trans i don't deal with too much but i can only imagine the complexity is very similar and with, with those sorts of uh transmission control modules you know there's talk requests going to and from uh, the the transmission control module will request a torque reduction maybe on an upshift and the ECU has to sort of report back that it's done what it's requested so I mean where do you even start with this how, how do you how do you get that right I usually start um, I like to just um, data log the stock ECU sometimes just look at the raw can and what I've been doing lately that's made this more efficient is I, I actually wrote a firmware for the M1 and I use the M1 as a can logger. Um, so instead of using, say, a, a pecan or some sort of traditional can sniffer and dumping a bunch of hex into an Excel sheet and trying to deal with it there, I just use the M1 to log the can, and then okay. I just look at it in I2. And so I can look at it graphically much better than in Excel. Sure. And uh, you'll start to see um the patterns and stuff and the more you do it the more you start to recognize you'll see a signal and it's like oh i know what that is i've seen that before right you may not know what the scaling of it is yet but you just recognize um the patterns you know you can see it you know hey that one must be you know the engine's torque output um yeah and and this one it's changing on a shift you know and just by the way it's behaving that surely must be the torque request from the transmission you know you can see the reduction on the shifts and things like that so yeah. I st and it's i start very broad and then and then you just keep data logging and keep reviewing it and you know you start to pick off hey i know what that one is now i know what that one is and you start to narrow it down um, but yeah using the m1 was a big game changer for me it just made it a lot easier i'm not a big excel uh guy i'm not super proficient at it i can use it um but getting the data into i2 made a huge difference so mm, yeah i can only imagine in terms of the skill set that you've now built up you know you go from automotive tech to budding tuner to uh successful experienced tuner and now you move into this world which i think it's fair to say not a lot of tuners can translate their skills across to writing code, which is what you're doing when you're building this custom firmware, and also reverse engineering can. How, how did you build that skill set and where did that come from? Do you see any sort of correlation between tuning and these other two skill sets? Um, you know, it's funny, when M1 came out, I was very excited. Um, about it because the hardware is more capable than the gold box and the software 
I guess I was a bit indifferent too. I was just excited to have more pins on the ECU at the time. That was a big yeah. deal. Um, when they showed us M1 Build, which is the software that's used for coding the firmware, I was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not a co <laughs> No, absolutely not. Um, I, I completely wrote it off. Like, I'm, that's yeah. not who I am. I know nothing about it. I've never coded a line of code in my life. Um, no. But it was, I couldn't let it go, the idea of it. Um, it was in, intoxicating in a way that I was like, man, that is the future right there. Like to be able to write your own firmware, I'm, I just couldn't leave it alone. And so I just started poking with it in my spare time. Um, tiny little things here and there. And uh, it really just kind of very slowly um, built up from that. Uh, I don't even want to know how many hours I've poured in the into build since it came out. Um, I don't watch much TV or anything like that. I'll be at home on the couch relaxing and I'll just have Just staring into the mic trucks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, awful, just an awful lot of time put into it. So I think I, I, I just relate it to, to my experience with, with build. And I mean, it's definitely nowhere near the, the level you're at, but I think, uh, I'd say to a degree necessity is the mother of invention and much like yourself when the when we first got our hands on an M1 uh, I, I wanted flex fuel and, and Motec did not right. offer flex fuel and, and that's where it started for me as well I, I was like <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna figure this out right. and to, to give some background for those who are sort of maybe coming at this and thinking is this possible I, I started with my degree in information engineering which involved a bit of coding and I, I got into my first lecture on that and my eyes glazed over I'm like that nah, this is this is not <laughs> this is not me at all I cannot get my head around this and then you know 10 plus years later I, I come back at it again but now I actually had had a reason to understand right. it and, and I mean it is a little bit dumbed down but I mean what I found as well with with the M1 build is you're not starting with a blank sheet of paper you can kind of go through an existing project and you see oh I can see how they did this and right. how they do that so again like like you say you don't start building you know a custom ECU for a Lamborghini Huracan you start with smaller tasks and, and, and right. kind of build your confidence I'd say that I'd be pretty embarrassed probably for anyone who actually knew uh, how to write code to, to see anything I've written it, it's probably pretty a pretty sketchy way of getting the job done but <laughs> but it worked and I had flex fuel out there before for before Motec did only for my own personal benefit right. and I felt I felt pretty good about it yep no that's what's cool about it and you don't have to take it to a super high level I have a couple friends that that's what they do they do coding and stuff and they use build and I mean they're at a level that I can't even fathom um, yeah but at the same time I can use it and get everything done that I need to do so it is approachable um, it does take time um, definitely but yeah it is really powerful um, to have that capability now as a in a commercial sense you know if you're looking at a potential new vehicle and, and you think there's going to be some demand for that vehicle for a, a MoTeC platform in the aftermarket yeah, how do you decide if it's going to be commercially viable because of course you know, Motec themselves in Australia or the US could develop their own firmware package for a popular vehicle and kind of potentially maybe cut you off at the knees a little bit or there's other aftermarket developers as well. So how do you sort of like weigh up the time that you're going to put into developing the, the firmware and, and whether that you think it's going to be commercially viable or is this just a bit of a gut feel? Yeah, I think I'm going to go for it. Yeah, it's a bit of a gut feel, I think. Um on some of the platforms because you're looking at it from two ways both how many do I think I can sell or how many how popular is it going to be but also how long it's going to take because it's a big difference between doing say uh, a side-by-side -side, um, versus the new super or something of course uh, massively different uh, time scale potentially involved there so um, yeah and do you represent that in the, the the price you charge for the finished package um, typically a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, it just depends on the application. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, it's hard to tell though. Sometimes, um, Motec's been really good to me. Um, I'll reach out to them sometimes and be like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this platform. Is this on your radar? Um, they'll be like, yeah, it's kind of on our radar, but if you'll do, if you're doing it, we'll not do it. Like if there's a 
option that's available that's a good option then yep. they just don't do it and then the same token if they offer an option like they have a, a package out for the toyota 86 i i would never do one i just use theirs so um, sure. there hasn't and that goes for there's some other motec developers out there that have done their own kits and i prefer just to use theirs if there's one available this all started because I just needed to do it to get ECUs in the car so I could tune the car, which was my original job. Uh, the M1 it's grown opened, a bit beyond that now. Yeah, it's grown a bit since then, but it's still foundationally just trying to trying to get ECUs in the cars and, yeah. and get to tuning them or get other guys tuning them. So if there's a, a, you know, a kit on the shelf that somebody offers that's a good kit, then sure, I'll just get that one. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this this relationship you've got with underground racing because you've had a lot of success with uh, underground, particularly in their half mile and, and roll race vehicles. And um, there's a pretty tense rivalry, I think, between the Lamborghini market and the R35 GTR market. Uh, I'm I'm not going to pick a side of that battle. <laughs> um, you know the, the the work that you've done for for underground there on the the Lambo package. You know how how has that sort of developed over time, and is that something that is exclusive to underground racing, or do you do a, a production version for public as well? Yeah, so it has developed over time. Like I look back at the the kits and the complexity that we had, you know, ten or twelve years ago, whenever we started, and it's changed an awful lot. I mean, the first Giardos we were doing had M eight hundred in it, so mm. um, yeah, obviously it's changed. A tremendous amount. Um, the stuff I do for them is all exclusive to them. We don't sell it to the public, um, which is why Motec had an opening to do their own Huracan kit, uh, mm -hmm. which they have out now. So it doesn't really compete with us. We don't compete with them. Um, yeah. So there is, you know, a couple kits out there for the M1 platform now uh, uh, for the Huracan and R8. So could could you give us you know, a a bit of a an, an idea maybe of, of what sets your uh, Huracan package apart from the, the production one that Motec offer? That'd be quite interesting, I think. Yeah, um, probably the biggest thing that sets it apart, honestly, is it's just mine is geared for underground and their specific needs. Like we just tailor it to what we specifically want and whether that's better or worse, it would be hard to, hard to say. Um, We've used both of them, um, but yeah, we've just been developing mine specifically for them so long. It's, I don't know, it's like an old shoe or something. It just fits sure. and fits right. Um, the Motec kit is a tremendous uh, bit of kit. Um, it's really well done. A bit more complex maybe in some ways. They're, I think their torque strategy is quite a bit more complex than mine. Um, okay. For better or for worse, that's for the end user to decide, I guess. So. Yeah, in terms of these vehicles as well, because underground are, are doing engines producing 1,500, 2,000 plus horsepower, but uh, a lot of these cars are still street driven. So, I mean, it's one thing to tune a, a, a drag engine that really only operates at either idle or wide open throttle, but I mean, at least from my perspective, it, it's actually a, often a lot more complex tuning an engine to cold start perfectly when there's snow on the ground. Uh, to restart when the engine bay is heat soaked, uh, to offer good fuel economy, perfect drivability at part throttle and nice crisp uh, transient enrichment, those sorts of things often I'll spend more time on than the wide open throttle tuning which I think is easy to overlook. So how, how, what's your approach on that and is there anything sp special you've done to, to get the best of both worlds there? Um. I think the the pat on the back for a lot of that falls more to the OEs than even myself because they've just equipped the engines with more systems that make that feasible. You know, okay. their quad variable camshaft and and direct injection and things like that. So we can modify them to a fairly high power level and the thing still drives amazing. You know, you just, you go through the normal steps of tuning it and fine tuning it and taking the time to make sure the cold starts right and make sure the drivability is right. But yeah, the, you know, the variable camshafts and things like that have just made a tremendous amount of difference. You know, you can make that kind of horsepower 
and the thing just drives like stock. You know, you could take a 2000 horsepower Lamborghini and take your wife to, to dinner in it and she won't even know it's not stock. And yeah. that's just, that's phenomenal compared to where we were at 10 years ago. What what about the the complexities of the integration there with the uh, dual clutch transmission? So we've sort of touched on this already, but there's a lot of toing and froing between the TCM and the ECU for the the engine and getting that integration correct. I can only imagine critical not only for smooth shifting but also for the life expectancy of the DCT. Yeah, it's definitely important for both of those. Um, it's it's kind of like your point of wide open throttle tuning being easier than maybe the drivability tuning. The same holds true with the transmission. It's relatively straightforward to process the TCU's torque reduction request and reduce the engine's power and make the shift, you know, something that it can do over and over again at full power. Um, that's not the hardest thing that we have to do. Uh, getting the torque requests and reductions right on part throttle driving around town kind of shifts, that definitely takes a lot more time to refine. The light throttle, throttle blips on downshifts and things like that so it's smooth and doesn't bump the car. Uh, yeah, it just takes a lot of time fine tuning and stuff. In terms of that torque reduction, so what what strategies are you using there? I mean, I'm guessing you can close the throttle or retard timing or fuel cut or ignition cut or some combination of all of those. And some are going to be probably smoother and some are going to be faster in a drag racing sense. So um, yeah, how, how do you decide where you're going there? Yeah, it depends on the shift, how much, how much load the engine's under and stuff. It's usually, um, I'll do an ignition retard fuel cut or a mix of the two. Um, I tend to stay away from closing the throttle most of the time just because it tends to not be the fastest thing in terms of power reduction on a shift. Sure. And uh, and then it slows the turbos down. So, um, so not then ideal you've got that delay when you get back into the next yeah. gear to get the turbos back on boost. Yeah, the ignition retard is probably the fastest acting one that I use. I don't use the cut ignition cut as much okay. uh, on the DCT stuff. Uh, and and on that that note as well, you've got a separate transmission control unit TCU you've mentioned there, which, which is controlling the the transmission and the shift and the pressures etc. Uh, is the programming required on on that separate to the ECU as well? when obviously some of these these vehicles with 2,000 plus horsepower are, are probably far from a standard transmission. Uh, yeah, how, how does that all get dealt with? Yeah, it does require programming the TCU to get the most out of it, you know, when you're changing, you know, clutches and, and things like that. Um, it goes to, I guess, it takes a village. Um, I don't do any of that kind of reflashing of OE modules or ECUs so there's other people that do that uh, underground yeah. it's Casey one of the owners he does all okay. the TC reflashing so definitely a team effort um, yep. in making those cars do what they do. Now we've seen you uh, at the likes of te Texas 2k back before the world went crazy and we we're <laughs> allowed to travel uh, which right. was great and uh, you know th these cars are so fast and I'm guessing probably at least in the first half of a track uh, probably have got more power than you can put to the ground. Is is power management a, a challenge? And sort of what what are you doing in terms of optimizing the car in an event like Texas Two K? Yeah, power management's definitely a struggle because it's definitely a balance. Um, you know, as you get into bigger turbos and stuff and lower gears, it's harder to get the turbo spooled, and so you have to manage the power, but you also want to be able to get the turbo going so when it so that it's ready when it hits the next gear um, mm. so that's a bit of a trick sometimes and uh yeah it's just using different approaches obviously boost control um sometimes getting throttle control in there sometimes the ignition timing um to to do different things so yeah you're usually using a multitude of of approaches to try and make that happen can you give us some insight into what that actually looks like inside the, the ECU? So are you using sort of timer-based control or is this uh, ground speed or, or gear-based for the things like your ignition retard and the throttle opening that you've mentioned? Yeah, for drag racing, I tend to like to use a timer. Um, 
it's very predictable off the start for the roll racing and things like that um often by gear maybe works a little bit better sure um yeah and when you're four-wheel drive like this is it fair to assume that traction control is not a, an available strategy mm, it's not unavailable it just there's strategies you can do um, you know, G-based and stuff, but you can also do some of the new GPSs out now are quite fantastic. Um, you can actually get a pretty good ground speed reference from a good GPS and do some traction control with that as well. So the older units that are probably more widely available were or still are 10 hertz GPS units, so they're only updating 10 times a second. And yeah. fair to say that that's not fast enough for the yeah, actual speed input to be useful. Yeah, it's definitely not fast enough. You got to get you know 20 to 50 hertz um, and the speed number is one thing but those higher end gps's definitely bring um, other things to the table to where the signal is just vastly superior um, sure. to what you get with that cheap unit but yeah you can do some cool stuff um, with one of those gps's now and the other option that that i guess is available is uh sort of profiling the run versus drive shaft speed uh measuring that and then profiling that to a theoretical perfect run so if there's a a jump in drive shaft speed that means that the the car's broken into wheel spin is that a, a technique that you you like to use or not so much um no i do like to use it i use it quite a bit drag racing um the the nice thing about that is if the car's carrying the front tires a bit it doesn't matter because um, mm. if you're trying to if you're allowed to use a traditional traction control and you're looking at the front wheel speeds it all goes out the window and the front end comes up so definitely um yeah i do like the drive shaft speed profile um kind of makes a little nice safety net you can have um if it blows the tires off yeah you can still catch it so and a lot of drag racing doesn't allow uh, wheel speed sensors at least yeah. you know not front ones so in that case you can still have that as an option now I, i've talked to a few people in the past who build the likes of pro mod drag engines who are uh how to put it maybe a little bit shy of using things like ignition and fuel cuts at very high specific power levels because of the potential to do uh, damage to the engine. Do you sort of buy into that theory? Is that something you've seen or not so much? No, I definitely buy into it. Um, some engines are more um, easily damaged by that than others. It's definitely a thing. Um, mm, okay. Some engines are very sensitive to it. Um, others, you know, it doesn't seem to phase them at all. So. Um, I feel like that's a situation where you really need to know your engine. Um, if your engine builder doesn't like what you're doing, maybe he's seen some stuff in the past on that particular engine and you should probably heed his advice um, yeah. type of thing. So yeah, definitely something to at least think about if you're getting super aggressive. Yep. There are things you can do to kind of mitigate it because it, uh, it usually seems to affect the exhaust valve side. I think the excessive back pressure, you know, turbocharged engine, and then you get pressure pulses from these explosions in the exhaust port and and suddenly the valves maybe not following the camshaft anymore and it depending on your what your valve train situation is you can get some real issues quick there so yeah as you say definitely more prevalent on on some types of engine compared to to others yeah when you're in an event like uh, Texas 2K and you're trying to optimize the car, w when the car goes down the track and it comes back and you download data, what what are you specifically looking for to decide what changes you're going to make for the next pass? Um, we're looking at a lot of things, you know, wheel speeds. Uh, you know, if you have a G uh, GPS speed reference, you can see kind of what your drive speed is on the four wheel drive. Yeah. Uh, the G sensors. Um, yeah, just feedback from the driver. I like to watch the car from there in person, see what it's doing, and then uh, just start adjusting it from there. Obviously, you're looking at all the engine data too. Make sure the engine's happy and doing what you want and, and not in any danger. And yeah, just start turning it up from there once you've established a reasonable baseline. Um, I like to start a little conservative because if you go out there and just keep blowing the tires off, you're learning nothing. So yeah. I like to get a solid pass in and then just use that as my foundation and just start adding power. Um, and do you find that changes during the, the course of an event as the, the track uh, evolves, as, as it gets more more rubbered in, as it gets prepped, et cetera? Or even as the, 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 
the um, temperature and sunlight change maybe yeah absolutely especially on some you know for some drag cars um, that's a very fine line i do you know some stuff with the irs supras and it's just it's like a hair's width that feels like the window um, for that thing between optimum performance and it's not even moving when you drop the trans brake you know so sure um, the lambos and the roll racing and things like that i feel the window is quite a bit wider um it seems like we can kind of the the tiny changes don't matter quite okay. as much um with that stuff got a little bit more sort of room for error potentially yeah now the other aspect here as well is is obviously keeping the engine alive and um, I, I've never been involved in half mile racing myself but uh, I, I hear that a lot of damage can get done in that second <laughs> quarter mile as it's a lot harder on the engine components so is, is that correct and, and is there anything you're doing to sort of try and keep the engines alive for the for the full half mile? Yeah I mean that's definitely correct um, when when we have them on kill and we're going for a record I mean it hit six gear probably at the quarter mile mark and i just don't even want to watch you know it's like <laughs> just keep your fingers things. crossed because you just put it all in and and you don't know for sure you know you do everything you can to make sure that thing's safe and we have a pretty good foundation and we really have a pretty good idea where the limit is at this point but sure. it doesn't stop us from from flirting with it to try and get a record you know so when you push it right up to the edge the edge isn't always in the same place. So yeah. there's a little bit of unknown there. So um, in terms of that edge, and you, you've said you sort of know kind of where that is, what's the limiting factor here? What What's stopping you from, from being able to make them go another three to five mile an hour faster? Um, I think at the moment, the biggest limiting factor we have is just the fuel. Okay. Um, Okay. We're still on race gas, so at some point uh, we probably need to make the move to methanol and maybe that would allow us to push a lot harder um, with a little bit wider window. So so is that in terms of the, the cooling properties of methanol compared to a petroleum-based fuel or is it octane or is it all of the above? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously the methanol, the, probably the biggest benefit is the cooling, yeah. um, especially on that long pull and uh and then just the other benefits that methanol brings to the table with the on a turbocharged engine like that the relative octane i guess as you'd put it um mm. as rich as it would be at those boost levels so yeah okay all right now you just mentioned in passing there your work with the independent rear suspension supras and uh, i mean we we interviewed cody from cody phillips racing uh back at texas 2k uh, who's running your firmware package and one of the interesting technologies that i think was maybe relatively new back then you just started playing with was the anti-wheelie strategy using an imu so uh, can can you talk to us about what that anti wheelie strategy is? Why it's needed? Why can't we just run wheelie bars? And uh, probably on top of that, we need to know what an IMU is. Sure, an IMU is. Uh, I mean, traditionally, an IMU. When most people think of an IMU, they just think of an accelerometer, a three-axis accelerometer. Um, but we have some newer IMU devices out now to take that quite a bit higher step um, and they'll actually internally generate things like pitch angle and roll angle um, and things like that which is pretty phenomenal so we're going and, a little beyond the traditional x y and z axis right uh, lateral acceleration g-force yep, correct yeah g-force yeah and some say. of them are incorporating very high level gps units and so we get some really fantastic data as to the as to the positioning of the chassis um, I guess as it were and we yep. can and we can see you know what the what the pitch angle is of the vehicle um, and log it and with anti-wheelie control we can use that data to reduce the engine power if it starts to pitch up farther than we feel we want it to um, okay a lot of these classes don't allow wheelie bars right. um, so that's the big one and the the big push really for wheelie control is twofold one obviously if you wheelie and got a pedal that's not the most efficient way to get to the end of the track um, so if we can do that process more efficiently than the driver maybe we can win a race that we otherwise wouldn't win yep 
Um, but probably the bigger one, honestly, for a lot of these guys, um, is if you get a big wheelie and don't catch it in time, it comes down hard. It does a fantastic amount of damage. I mean, just makes your eyes water. You know, mm -hmm. guys are breaking engine blocks and bending chassis and breaking who knows what, you know, and yeah. uh, it can, it can be really expensive. So when we originally started down this path, it was really to protect these cars first, because these guys aren't professionals, you know, they don't have spare shells sitting back at home that they can just move things over to this is their baby you know and yeah it's a big deal when it gets damaged um, so that was job one is just hey can we use this technology to protect this chassis um, and we found right away with a little bit of tweaking it worked quite well for that um, now in terms of options available because anti wheelie actually isn't anything particularly new and and sort of high-end sports bikes have this built in straight off the showroom floor right and, and as i understand it uh laser ride height is, is a, a pretty common strategy in the oe world for anti wheelie uh you've got the other option maybe of limited use using ride height or shock travel potentiometers at the front end it seems like the IMUs may be the, the difficult option to choose in order to achieve that strategy. Uh, what was your thought process behind going around it that way rather than something like laser ride height? Um, the laser ride height actually works quite well. Um, a lot of people use it. Um, I think what started me down the IMU road was just a combination of knowing that's what sport bikes and OEMs did with the sport bikes and just being intrigued by that. And then my friend Sander had he was working on a sensor that would generate the requisite data to do that and mm. it began as hey let's try this out this is kind of cool um and it just morphed from there and uh you know the strategies improved but his sensors improved you know by a magnitude of a thousand or some big number compared to the very first sensor you know it's his well, newest stuff is unreal so we've had sander on the podcast already and i'll, I'll drop a, a link in the show notes that you can follow if someone wants to go and listen to that but we, we do talk about his imu in in that podcast i think it's fair to say sander is a damn rocket scientist this, he is, is. this is a super smart <laughs> dude but you know where, where's the difference lie between a, a production sort of enthusiast level IMU that that you know people might be finding out on the market at the moment at a relatively low price point and the likes of, of what Sanders unit that you're using where's the differences um it's just the quality of the data and obviously there's a price difference you know probably tenfold more for the good sure. one but when you when you factor in the price of a really good just traditional IMU and say a really good GPS unit, which is also nice data to have on the car, then suddenly this very nice unit that's fully integrated with both is not really that much more money than those other two pieces. Mm. Um, and the data you get out of it is, in my opinion, better, but you also get channels that you don't natively get out of those other two devices by themselves. Um, it just, yeah. the it's just incredible what it, it outputs and you can just put that data to work in your firmware strategies or if you just want to data log it um, yeah. that's fine too so uh, what are what are you sort of doing there then you you can just target a particular um front ride height or sorry pitch angle i guess is what we're actually talking about here you can target a particular pitch angle and then you've got a closed loop strategy for power management or torque management in order to just ride that yeah, because a lot of times we we don't necessarily mind that the front wheels are coming off the ground a bit. Um, sure. So like a, a yeah, suspension sensor. It's got all of that load transfer back onto the rear right. wheels to maximize a traction. Sus a suspension sensor or something doesn't really work very good for that. So it's you're either looking at you know a laser sensor or the IMU. So yeah, we can just figure out kind of what pitch angle we consider the right place to be. And I'll usually do a bit of a window um, on the power management to where it's like yeah this is an okay area for the car to be in <clears throat> if it goes a little bit higher than that that's okay but we kind of start taking corrective action like we start rolling some power out yeah and then there's definitely a line in the sand where okay we've given up on maybe making this run as good as it can be now we just need to save, save the, car. the car yeah yeah so yeah, there, okay. there's definitely a harder cut that you can get into if the car gets past the point of no return and we just need to get the front end back down so 
Ultimately, I'm guessing though this isn't a, a magic cure for just throw all of the power at the car out of the hole and, and send it and, and let the the wheelie strategy save the the run. I'm, I'm guessing you're still trying to tune the the power delivery so that you're you're only riding just starting to touch that anti wheelie strategy. Is is that sort of a, a safe assumption? Yeah, that's definitely the approach. I treat it like traction control. If I can get close to it and never yep. use it, that's perfect to me. Yeah. Um, because it is reducing the power. So if you can do other things to not do that, you know, if you can make chassis adjustments to keep that front end down without reducing the power, that's going to make a faster car. Um, and if you can manage the power so that it doesn't have to cut it, you know, half a second out to keep the front end down, that's going to make a faster car. So ultimately it is about power management and chassis management first and then that's yep. it was always meant to be a safety net to sure. protect the car and and in a perfect world say you know try and win the run still so yeah i mean i guess in that respect it's no different to the likes of closed loop fuel control or not control they're not there as a alternative <laughs> to actually tuning the fuel and ignition tables properly they're, they're there as a safety backstop in case something's just not quite right and it can come along and pick up the pieces behind you yep absolutely all right let, let's finish up here i just wanted to get back to where we started this conversation sure. which is around ryan's judd v10 and i just want to go through the the process involved with that and i've sort of followed this build i follow ryan and obviously yourself on on instagram uh and you know, it was pretty exciting i think ryan posted a video uh, a fair while back of uh judd actually running that engine on their dyno in the uk and then just recently you, you've run it back up on a rolling road here well, over there in the US yeah. so how, how did that go down uh, is, did Judd run that engine on their own ECU whatever it was that those were equipped with or you know was it on the M1 that you were using yeah they ran it on the M1 that we had we'd purchased for that car and uh, the Judd engine had a a wire harness on the engine that looked like it probably interfaced with a you know some sort of formula car or mm. uh, you know Le Mans type car and uh, I built a very quick um, interface between that harness and the M1 ECU and shipped that over to them and okay. uh, loaded the ECU up with the firmware we're going to run. And then, yeah, we ran that on the engine dyno. And when it was run on the engine dyno, were you remote tuning that or was that all in Judd's hands? That was all in Judd's hands. Okay. They, had a, they happened to have a M1 base map for it already. So I think right. they just kind of merged that into our firmware and, and made a few runs on the dyno to make sure it was all good. And that was yeah. that. Okay. So fast forward to, to the engine shipping to the US and, and getting put into this A90 Supra chassis. Uh, was, it, was, it sort of, was there any fundamental change in the, the specification at that point? Or is it just bolt on stuff? Um, no major change to the engine itself. We did convert it to drive-by wire um, upon installing it into the Supra. That was always part of the plan so we could have yep. some proper downshift blips with the sequential trans. Yep. And uh, of course, a different exhaust system than was on the dyno. You know, it's got a full um, exhaust out to the back of the car. Um, on the dyno, it just had some basic headers on it. So um, those are probably the two main changes to the engine specification. So on that basis, you know, the the calibration that Judd had in the M1 from their engine dyno setup, was it broadly in the ballpark? Was that enough to work from or was it a clean sheet start from scratch approach? No, it was, uh, it was broadly in the ballpark. There's places where it needed more fuel, places where it needed less, and it's likely just the change in the exhaust system um, yeah. that made that uh, necessary. Uh, but yeah, it was quite good right out of the box. So. And then uh, we did a fair bit on the dyno even of just kind of drivability tuning, um, sure. kind of cleaning it up. Um, I think the use of the car is going to be a bit different than probably what they would normally use it for. So some of that part throttle stuff's a touch more important um, for what we're doing. But yeah, we yeah, just okay. cleaned that up a little bit. But yeah, it was, it was good. With with such a highly developed engine revving to, uh, what, 11,000 odd RPM yeah. is is it possible to still get good drivability or it, when we say drivability is it sort of you know a relative term um 
it's a bit relative, but we were talking about it. It's shockingly good. Um, okay. the, you know, you fire, the, we're idling the engine around 2200 RPM and it sounds so tame at idle. <laughs> and uh, the drivability is really good. It's a little touchy sometimes, especially in the dyno. Like if the car starts lurching, the throttle is so responsive that you can kind of get into a bucking situation. Yeah. But if you can avoid that, it, it's, it's surprisingly docile. Um, okay and drives quite good you know the injectors are spraying in above the slides and you can just sit and watch the fuel getting pulled around <laughs> the slides at idle and i'm like how does that even drive as nice as it does it's, yeah it's it's quite good are we allowed to get some insight into the numbers it produced yeah so we weren't able to rev it all the way out um quite yet on the dyno we got a a bit of a mystery issue with the drive-by-wire, um, potentially vibration-induced, um, but it made, I think, right at 640 at the tire, revving the 10,500, um, the power's still going up, so I think it's probably going to do 650, 660 wow. to the tire on the dyno, um, and it did 750 at the engine at Judd, so... <laughs> <laughs> that's insane i yeah I, yeah i definitely can't wait to uh can't wait to hear it yeah it's fantastic so now a, a lot of the the tuning that you're involved with you do remotely this one you actually flew to the dyno facility and did it in person is that just because you wanted to hear it firsthand or is there, <laughs> is there a reason <laughs> Uh, shamefully, yeah, that was a big part of it. Um, yeah. It would have been a very easy one to do remotely, but um, yeah, I just wanted to hear it. So um, okay. I hadn't gotten to hear the car run in person because I did the startup remotely and I didn't get to go to Judd with Ryan. Um, to so you really it, drawing so. the short straw here the whole way through. Yeah, I was. So I was very keen to uh, to jump on an airplane and, and hear it on the dyno in person. So yeah. Yeah. I don't think anyone would hold that against you. <laughs> All right, look, uh, I think we'll, we'll get on towards wrapping this up here, John, as I do appreciate your time. And there's, there's two last questions that we, we ask all of our guests. The first of those is, given uh, your success in the industry and the reputation you've built up, if you could give any words of wisdom to a younger version of yourself or someone looking to, to maybe get into the industry and get to where you've got to, is there any advice you could give to potentially fast track that uh, career path? Yeah, I mean, I do have guys ask me this um, and it's hard to point people maybe in a direction to that's as straightforward as say, you know, if you want to be a doctor, nurse, engineer, pick a career, you know, um, mm. this one's a little bit harder. Um, to promote you guys a bit my my two my two answers to them are the product you guys offer is fantastic for training um and then i feel if you want to do tuning and stuff it's take your money and spend it on like stuff you offer and then buy a standalone and just put it in a stock car and yep. then with those two components together uh, you can go far um, I think it's better than a lot of other things that you could maybe do to try and get into this um, into this industry. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously we, we back ourselves with the courses, <laughs> but do appreciate the props there, John. But um, I, I I think the the two components there do go hand in hand. Uh, what what I created or we created through HPA was essentially the information that. I was missing when I started my career and I kind of had to learn it all the hard way and I, I think what we've done with HPA is created courses that will fast track that journey and help avoid the the pitfalls and, and mistakes that we all make when we're learning but beyond that obviously it, it is a skill where actually hands on with the laptop with the tuning software is still vital you, you're not going to come out the end of any course no matter what it is as an expert you've actually got to get the runs on the board so yeah 100% agree a cheap car as I said at the start maybe not a Mark IV Supra because we certainly right. can't call those cheap anymore <laughs> and uh and something that's going to be a, a pretty difficult or pretty resilient to your early tuning uh right. mistakes is, is probably the way to go yeah all right and uh last question for today john if people want to follow your journey uh, or reach out uh, how can they do so what are, where, where are you at um yeah you can go to my website uh johnreedracing.com uh, if you want to follow on social media instagram is probably where the most action is just John Reed Racing on instagram Perfect. All right, John, really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming yeah, along. Yeah, thank you.
All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can re-watch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions you'll also get Get access to our regular weekly members webinars which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm we dive into that topic for about an hour if you can watch live you can ask questions and get answers in real time if the time zones don't work for you that's fine too you're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive we've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive it is an absolute gold mine so remember that coupon code podcast 75 check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses